Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Kerry Butler. I lead Faith Christian Center right here in Austell, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today. I believe today's message is going to equip you and empower you to make Jesus famous in your everyday life. As you listen, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up to the message, apply it, and I'll talk to you after today's message. Glory to God. Come on, lift your hands, give God praise and glory for a moment. Thank you, Father, that all of our failures are washed away, that you love us so much, and you have such a bright future for us. We love you, Father, because you first loved us. Glory to God. Well, hello, Faith. How are you all doing today? God been good to you? Amen. It's an honor to be back with you once again. I always love coming down here and having the opportunity to see so many of you and, and have the opportunity to, you know, just worship with you and share God's word with you. Of course, I, I've, as I shared earlier today, you know, a couple times a year, the Lord has to get on me about being willing and obedient because I'm, a couple times a year, I'm like, Lord, why you make us leave Georgia? We loved Atlanta. We loved it. And we would come back in a heartbeat, but God didn't let us. You know, he wouldn't let us do that. But uh, we just love you guys. We love being here. Uh, we've left you in great hands. You have a phenomenal pastor, phenomenal first lady, <laughs> Pastor Carrick and Mikhail. And uh, I just, I believe I should share again what I shared in the first service. And I was watching a video the other day, and it was talking about the Chinese bamboo tree. And it was talking about the fact that that tree is very different. You plant that seed and you don't see any results for almost five years. And so you literally could be someone that planted that tree uh, who has to come by and waters, water which just appears to be ground. But in the fifth year, it shoots up to about 90 feet tall in six weeks. And, you know, where, where, when did all that growth come from? Did it happen just in six weeks? No, really in those five years. Under the ground, the work was being done to produce the results that we finally see at the end of five years. And I really believe that's a real picture of what God is doing in so many of our lives. I know that's been the case in my life. What God is doing in this church, God has a great destiny for this church. Uh, he, from the day God spoke, first spoke to our bishop, to while I was here, to now as Pastor Carrick is ministering, uh, the same thing has been said about this church. It will shake Atlanta. It will have a major impact in this region. God's going to do some outstanding things here. The future's bright. So I'm excited not only about what God is doing right now, I'm excited about what God is going to do here. Make sure you're connected, you're doing your part because God has something just absolutely amazing for you all's future. But let's pray. We're going to jump right into what God has for me to share. Father, we thank you for the privilege of uh, sharing your word from heaven, Taylor May, for this particular moment in our lives. We thank you, Father, that you've already showed up in this place. And we pray that you just continue to move up and down the aisles and heal and reveal and encourage that you simply have your way today. We're open to anything you want to do during this time. And we give you the praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. And if you would, open your Bibles to Jeremiah 29, 11 and Psalm 126, 1. Jeremiah 29, 11 and Psalm 126, verse 1. And today I'm going to read from a number of translations, but you can definitely follow along in your King James, New King James, whatever particular translation you happen, happen to have. I'll start in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. I like to read this from the message translation. This is probably my favorite scripture in the Bible. It reads, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. So notice that God has plans, not just to give Israel the future that they hope for at that time, but he has plans to give all of us the future that we hope for. It's a good future. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the just is like a shining light. It shines more and more. In 
other words, your, your light is only going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. But then notice Psalm 126 and verse 1. It says in message translation, it seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. Well, what are they talking about here is a moment where God gave them the future they hoped for. They were able to come back to their land. And they said, man, it was so good, it seemed like a dream. It was so good, it felt like I had to pinch myself to make sure I was actually awake. And, you know, everybody has dreams that we want to experience. Everybody has dreams of making a mark in this world. I don't know who, care who you are, if you happen to be a Christian or not. The way you're wired is you want to make a difference. And yet, you know, some people uh, reach a point in their lives where they don't know why their dream hasn't happened yet. Or maybe they think about their younger self and the plans their younger self had for their lives. And now they're sitting here years later saying, how come that didn't happen? Why am I not experiencing that right now? There are other people that, because of that, just outright gave up on those dreams. And some people indeed live and die without actually experiencing the dreams that God placed in their heart. And what I have in my heart to share today is something that's going to, I think, give you uh, the missing ingredient to living those dreams. And others may know what you need to do. You just need a kick in the pants. And this message, I think, will help give you that as well. So the title of my message today is Hustle. Hustle. And uh, I like to define hustle as to have the courage, confidence, and determination to work until you find the success you want in life. To hustle is to have the courage, the confidence, confidence and determination to work until you find the success you want in life. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to jump right in. You know, just thinking about living the dream God has for you, uh, I ran across a, a post a while back, and it just simply said, you ever stopped and thought, wow, I prayed for this. It's here. It's happening. And I remember a couple weeks ago, I was pulling up to church that I pastor in Detroit, Faith, Faith Experience Church, FX Church, and I was with my youngest daughter, and I had one of those moments. And the Lord spoke to me about that church almost six years ago, and uh, it took a long time for it to happen. And there were many, many times where the people that I listened to or even I myself just felt like, well, that was never going to happen. But I, I kept telling my kids, you know, one day I'm a pastor of church. I'm a pastor of church in downtown Detroit. They look at me like I'm crazy. Like, you know, that's never going to happen. And yet here I am pulling into the church. So I turned to my 10-year-old and I said, you remember when we were talking about this church? It's like, here we are. We're actually walking in the church. We're like, I, don't, I still don't think she fully grasped what I was saying. But I sure did. I'm like, man, look at this. It's happened. But I can tell you one of the reasons why it's happened is because we hustled. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. I got a little echo up here. Uh, sounds help me out a little bit. I'm going to read this to you from the Bible in basic English. The Apostle Paul is speaking here, and he's talking about the church of Corinth. This is a church that he started in this particular city, and he's not happy with uh, some things that they're doing and he makes a point in verse 6 he says I did the planting Apollos did the watering but God gave the increase for we are workers with God in verse 9 you are God's planting God's building so notice Paul's talking about this church that he started God used him to sow the seed of his word in the people's hearts that's how they became Christians that's how they became a part of God's family. Then God used Apollos to come in and teach the word of God so they could grow into the people God wanted them to be. And so he's saying, I did the planting and Apollos did the watering, but ultimately God is the one that's produced the results that you see right now. God has done great things in your life. God has done great things by starting this church. And then he goes on to sum it up by saying, see, we are workers together with God. So it's not that I did this. It's not that Apollos did this. It's not that God did it by himself. No, we all did this together. 
In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, he says something very similar. He says, we then as workers together with him also plead with you. And so one of the things that we can get out of this is simply that we have to work together with God to get the results that we want, which means that we need to give God something to work with. Uh, I, in my house, I, I, I did something. I guess I'll have to, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of ashamed to talk about it. But, you know, we had Christmas this last Christmas. Uh, of course, we always keep our tree up until after New Year's. And so on January 2nd, I believe, you know, I took the tree down. But at the time I took the tree down, my wife wasn't home. My oldest daughter wasn't home. My other two weren't strong enough to help me. So I took the tree. I took it out of the, the house. I brought it in the garage. I put it right by the door thinking I'll make sure that, you know, when Tiffany comes home or and maybe when Alexis comes home or maybe when my dad comes over or my brother-in-laws come over, they'll help me put it where it's supposed to be. And yet, a couple weeks ago, it was still sitting <laughs> at that same place at the garage. And the problem wasn't that Tiffany hadn't come home, that Alexis hadn't come home, that uh, my brother-in-laws hadn't visited or my dad hadn't been there. The problem was I hadn't given them anything to work with right? I needed to go ahead and make a decision to say something. And then together we can move it and get where we need to be. And the same thing is true concerning our dreams. Sometimes our dream is sitting by the door. And we're saying, God, how come this hasn't happened? How come I'm not where I want to be? And the problem is you have to work together with him. You've got to give him something to work with. All right. So then Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21 and verse 31. This is a scripture that God dropped in my heart a couple years ago that has just completely re rearranged my thinking. It reads, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. The horse is prepared. Of course, think, think back to Bible times when you went to battle. You know, many times you would ride on horseback. But of course, what you would have to do then before you got to that day of battle is you'd have to pick the right horse. You'd have to train the horse. On the day of battle, you'd have to shoe the horse or you've got to put a saddle on that horse. And then you would be ready to go into war. And so notice here he's telling us that the horse is prepared by who? By man. But ultimately, safety, protection, victory comes from God. So we can see again that you got to work together with God to get the results that you want. But we can also see something else here, and that is, is when we do our part, that then God does his part. I'm going to say that again. When we do our part, then God does his part. You can imagine it would have been silly for a man back then to know that God promised him victory, and so when the battle happens, he just kind of runs out on the field with no horse, no armor, no shield, no sword, no clothes, and say, well, God's giving me victory. He's going to die that day, right? Because that's not how God works. The way God works is you got to do your part, and then God's going to step in and do his part. He has no interest in you doing 0% and him doing 100%. Or as uh, Kenneth Hagin used to say, there is a natural side and a supernatural side to every blessing from God. And I learned this. I, I shared earlier that I was here yesterday, a day early, because we did a casting call for uh, the film that I'm producing and that I wrote called Match Made. And uh, I'm excited about that. God's doing some great things there. But I have actually wrote that script a number of years ago. And early on, tried a few things. It wasn't the right time. But more recently, you know, I got to the place where, you know, it was just sitting there. And, you know, I had had a couple times where I tried to step out and some doors were closed on me. And I just kind of got super spiritual about it. Well, it must not be time. And it wasn't that. It was that I was kind of sitting on my hands waiting on God when God was waiting on me. And... Uh, eventually, uh, we were actually in a small group meeting that we were having for our church in, in Detroit. I was with, meeting with some of our strategy team, and out of that small group just came, you know, this revelation just burst out of us. In fact, this whole series that I preached on Hustle came out of that, and I, I consider that a billion-dollar small group meeting, by the way, by the time God gets done doing everything he's going to do. So don't miss your small group because you never know. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, God really dropped some things in me. No, this is time for you to do this. I'm waiting on you to do your part. 
So I picked up the phone and, and called a friend of mine and said, hey, you know, I, I'm, willing, I'm ready to go ahead and start doing something with this film. You know, can we talk sometime? He's like, man, I'm, I'm actually in Detroit right now. So let's go over and meet. So we went over and met at a Starbucks. And ever since then, since I started doing my part, God started moving. And doors start opening, things start flowing. You know, we just had uh, this week another breakthrough that happened. And I mean, it's like, wow. And I, I, there's a part of me that wonders, should this have not happened a couple of years ago? Has God really been waiting on me all this time while I caught myself waiting on him? You know, when you jump in the car, if you want to use a GPS, maybe you've got a, an iPhone or you got one of those other junkie type phones. Um, no. <laughs> Maybe if you use Waze or something like that. When does, when does Siri start talking? When you start moving. You just sit there all this time and you're just like, well, how come it's not telling me where to go? It doesn't work like that. It's when you do your part that it does his part. So once again, when we do our part, then God does his part. Let's go a step farther. Go up, if you will, to 1 Samuel 17. Somebody turn to him and tell him, you got to hustle. Turn to somebody else and tell him, get your hustle on. <laughs> First, seven, First Samuel chapter 17. Now, this is a story of David. Of course, David uh, was actually not a part of the army during this time. He actually showed up, brings uh, you know, a fish and chip dinner to his brothers uh, since they were in the army. And Goliath, of course, has been stepping on the battlefield for 40 days, taunting Israel, saying, if you would just send out one champion and we fight, then the winner side can win this war. But since Goliath is almost nine feet tall, he's absolutely massive, all of Israel is afraid to fight him. So David hears this, and he begins to hear about what the reward was for actually fighting and defeating Goliath. And in verse 25, I'll read this from the New Living Translation. It reads, have you seen the giant? The men ask. He comes out each day to defy Israel. And the king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. And the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. I don't know about you, but that's reason enough to go. <laughs> Just to not have to pay taxes? I mean, hey, hey, hallelujah. No, but so... Of course, David, of course, hears this, and uh, he asked the shoulder, soldier standing nearby, what, what will a man get for killing a Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is a reward for killing him. So he walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. So David is asking, he's, he's almost confirming that if I kill this guy, that I get one of the king's daughters and I get to live tax-free. Now, why is he doing that except that he's planning something, right? So David ends up in front of Saul and he actually says, uh, I believe in verse 30 or verse 32, he says, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. And Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with the club and rescue the lamb from his mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done, it, done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do this do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, I want you to put yourself in his position here. David's about 17 years old, and we don't have any reason to believe that he was extraordinarily tall, big, strong, etc. He seems to be a normal-sized guy, good warrior, but nowhere near Goliath, right? Goliath, as we said, is about nine feet tall. He's been a champion for who knows how many years. And David is volunteering to fight him. Nobody asked him to. It's not his duty. He literally just showed up to bring some food for his brothers. But he's volunteering to fight Goliath. Now, we don't have a Goliath today, but let's just talk about Shaquille O'Neal. 
He's got to be about 7'1". I guess he was about 330 at the time. He's probably about 400 by now. <laughs> right? Would you volunteer to fight Shaquille O'Neal? Especially if he had armor on and a, a shield and a sword and a spear. I wouldn't. Mm -mm. I mean, you know, most people wouldn't do that. But David's doing that. Well, what in the world? And, and I, I want you to realize that David is not just talking junk. He's not just one of them guys that want to talk about how I'm going to score 50 on you and then they score five, you know. Everybody knows somebody like that, right? He, he not he, he, no, he's serious. He actually expects to defeat Goliath. And what's, and what's so wild is that he actually argues for the right to fight Goliath. And he does all of this without having received a word from the Lord. The Lord didn't tell him to do this. We don't have scripture that says, and the Lord told David, fight Goliath, and David had to work up his faith. No. He just volunteered, like, hey, I'm fighting him. And God didn't even tell him to do it. But see, he, he, he knew something. He had already experienced victory that simply was not normal. Hey, he says, a lion came and took one of the sheep. I chased it. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. <laughs> I would fight Shaq before I fight a lion. I, used to, I like to watch those lion videos sometimes on Facebook. I don't know why. I just, I just started watching these animal videos. I'm not talking about a little kitten or a little dog. I like to watch lions like fight hyenas and bears. And, and I've been watching these dudes, and they're huge. And they're strong. And if I was David and a lion came and took one of the sheep, I'd be like, I'm sorry, bye. <laughs> See you in heaven, right? In fact, forget the rest of the sheep. <laughs> David sitting out here and a lion takes one of the sheep and he chases it. When he hits it, it turns and faces him. And he grabs it by the beard and kills it and does the same thing to a bear. So he's had past victories. God, and you know, he ain't the only one. I think there's some people in here today who's had some past victories. Anybody have God do some, of the, some impossible things in your life? He had some past victories, and that's why he was so confident to say, hey, let me fight him. He knew he had been anointed by God, in his case, to be king. He knew he had something on him. So he was convinced that if I step out and I fight in this battle, God would back me up. He was convinced that God would back him up. And that's why he was so willing to step out and put his life on the line. That was why he was willing to argue for the right to do so. Because he knew that when you step out, God will back you up. And the same thing is true for every one of us. One of the things we have to watch out for is we've got to uh, avoid the paralysis of analysis. That place where we're kind of frozen, almost in fear, and we don't actually do what God put in our hearts to do. Uh, you know, light, in life, there's something called windows of opportunity. And when those windows come, you got to take them. And when they come, they close a lot quicker than we, we like to think they do. And sometimes what happens, I'm sure I've missed some windows in my life, because you get to this place where you're, you're almost, you're thinking too much, or you feel like i got to have this spectacular word from God. The heavens have to open. God's head has to come into my house and say, Andre, now, you know, before I actually step out. I, I, and T.D. Jake said it this way. I think this is so good. He said, too many of us are praying for a chair when God gave you a tree. You, God already gave you what, something that you can use to create your tree. But you're sitting there looking at the tree, Lord, where's my chair? Where, where, where's this dream? Well, how come this hasn't happened? How come that hasn't happened? Because you haven't stepped out and use what God has already given you. 
You haven't stepped out and put your hand to, to the plow, so to speak. In fact, if you go into the Old Testament, you'll see this over and over again where the Bible teaches that God will prosper what you put your hand unto, that God will prosper all that you do. So the question becomes, what are you doing about your dream? Are you sitting and waiting for God to do something when God put a tree in front of you and he's waiting for you to do something? David had understanding that I have God already gave me this vision and, and God is backing me up, so I'm just going to go for it. And, and we got to have the same understanding. The world seems to get this. The world seems to have an idea that if I got an idea, I'm going to get on my grind. I'm going to make this thing work. I'm a, but sometimes Christians do the complete opposite, and we get an idea, and we feel like the heavens have to open and the choir has to sing before I actually try to do anything about it. And that's why you see so many people who don't follow God have so much success, and those who do follow God end up broke. Because we've gotten into a bit of a ditch. And I can say this defined my life because, you know, I, I, this is one of those things where I struggle, where I'm like, hey, man, I got to make sure I hear from God on every little thing, and, and, and so I'm not doing anything when God told me a while ago. And I'm asking for an extra something. God, make sure, I want to make sure it's you, God. And God, like, I don't work like that. I expect you to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm not here for your comfort. I'm here for your faith. So I had some windows pass by because I, I need God to, to tell me again. You know what that's called? That's called fear. And that will keep you from the future that God has for you. We need to follow David's example and step out on what we know, trusting that God will back us up. Let's go to Acts chapter 20, 23. You know, when you you're driving, the default position when you get in your car, what are you doing most of the time? You're moving. Right? That's the default position of a car. It's moving. It's moving. Now, every once in a while, you're going to have to slow down. Every once in a while, you'll have to stop. But the default position of a car is moving. That's supposed to be the default position of a Christian. You should be moving, chasing after the dream God has given you. You should always be sensitive to the fact that God might say, oh, slow down. That God might say, nope, stop, this is not the time. But that's, that your, your default position isn't sitting at a red light. That's not supposed to be your life. Your life is I'm moving, I'm chasing after this dream, I'm making this happen, I'm doing my part, and I'm sensitive to the red light, the yellow light. And not the other way around. See, it's time for some of you to shoot your shot. Just do it. I mean, cliches I got to throw out there. Be a go-getter. Chase your dream. It's time for some of us to actually get to work so that we can see our dreams come to pass. Grind comes before glory. And for some reason, some of us got the idea that being a Christian means that I don't really have to work that hard. No, that's not how it works. You put in 100% effort, baby, and God will put his super on your natural. But if you don't give him nothing to work with, see, I'm all, all off my message. I'm trying to help you all get this. You got to step out on what you know, and then God will meet you there. I like something that one of our team members said in, 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 in Michigan. She said, opportunities don't disappear. They usually simply just go to other people. They just go to other people because they get on the grind. They hustle. And that's what we need to do as well. Well, Acts. Acts chapter 27 for the third time or second time or whatever. What did I say? 27, 23, excuse me. Here in Acts chapter 23, Paul is in a very dangerous position. What's happened with him is he's in Jerusalem. Uh, he's been preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. And now he's brought before the very council that sentenced Jesus to death. 
And his and of course, when he gets in front of that council, you can you know how bad things are, because when he starts to talk, the high priest has somebody slap him. He gets mad, he gets angry, you know, calls him a whited wall. I don't know what that means today. I have no idea. But and then you know, eventually they say to him, "Would you speak that way to the high priest?" And he actually checks himself. Oh, I didn't know he was the high priest, because you know God's word says, "Don't speak ill of your of your leaders, your rulers," and that's something we can learn from, because. You know, that was an evil high priest. That was the high priest that, that sent Jesus to the cross. And Paul still recognized, I shouldn't be putting my mouth on him. Well, thank you for that one amen. <laughs> At some point, we got to grow up and be Christians in this country. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all like, you can, you can lead now, Pastor. You go back to Detroit. But it's true. We got to grow up a little bit. Glory to God. I'm trying to move off of that. Lord, <laughs> Lord not let me. Uh, you know, the idea of uh, this country has always had wicked leaders. It's also always had good leaders. And God's word in regards to how we respond to leaders never changed. It says honor the king. It says to respect leadership. It tells you, even in the workplace, to make sure you're acting right, even if you've got a, an evil boss. It says anybody can act up. But if you act right, then God will come in and make things right for you. But while you're acting up, now you're you, you locking God out. You don't allow him to do anything. So you need to be very careful about your mouth and what, what, how you are acting. And, and I'm not trying to say we have a wicked leader now or that we don't. I'm not even going to even get into that. I know better than that. But I do think part of the conversation right now is ridiculous. It's ridiculous for Christians to act like people who don't know God. It's ridiculous the words that are coming out of our mouths. It's ridiculous the stuff that we're posting online. It is a shame. And we're not going to win people to Jesus when we're acting just like them. There's always a better way. That has nothing to do with hustle. But I am a servant. I do what God wants me to, to say what he wants me to say. Goodness gracious. All right, so pause in front of these people. They just had him slapped. And the Bible says in verse 6, I'll read this from New Living Translation. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors. And I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For the Fa Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. And as the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. So understand what's happened here is that Paul is in danger. He looks around the room and he notices half the room are Sadducees and half the room are Pharisees. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't even believe in, in spirits or angels. I don't know how half of the leaders of Israel got to that place. It's unreal when you think about it because of their history. But that's where they are. They don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in angels, which means they probably didn't believe in heaven or hell, and that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> Paul notices half the room are Sadducees, half are Pharisees, I know how I'm going to get out of this. I'm a Pharisee. My daddy was a Pharisee. I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees immediately jump up. It becomes a political issue. Oh, he, this is our guy. Whatever happened to him, we, we believe in the Sadducees are against him, and they end up getting into this big uproar. And the Roman soldiers who the day before were about to whip Paul are the very ones that end up coming in to rescue Paul. How did he get out of this? Was it by a great word of the Lord? It was actually by him using something God gave him. It's called his brain. You don't see a word of the Lord here. In fact, the Lord speaks to him after he gets out of it. The very next scripture in verse 11, God talks to him about his future. But up until this point, there was no prompting of the Holy Ghost. There was no special word of the Lord. He looked around and he noticed 
half of these dudes are Sadducees, half of these dudes are Pharisees. I'm just going to put these folk against each other, and I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. In fact, if you were to back up the scripture, a few scriptures before this, he did the same type of thing then because the Roman soldiers were about to scourge him like they did Jesus with the cat of nine tails and all of that. And so they're getting him ready, and he says, is it legal for you to scourge a Roman? They go, ooh, are you a Roman? Well, what, what, what's going on? You are not allowed to scourge a Roman citizen. You couldn't even bind a Roman citizen. So now they're afraid. Well, once again, was there prompting? No, he used his brain. You know, one, one physicist said this. He said about the human brain, he said, the human brain has 100 billion neurons. 